my name is Chief Patrick Michelle, and I, I've spent a lot of time building capacities through reading, writing, and learning. And I've learned starting in 2012 about something called PowerPoint. I used to do all my work previously in pencil crayon because that's what I knew. I'm, I've got a technology gap and you see that when it comes to hardware and software, but I spent a couple of days putting this together. So on this opening slide, what you're seeing here is Kite Creek Lake number one, which was logged, uh, clear cut logged in starting in 1970 and finished by 1981. The logging camps are still there as is all of their garbage. But on, on the second slide, what you're gonna see here is how we would harvest trees. We take strips off of them. So we're able to harvest the same tree over hundreds of years. So in the very first image, you'll see a difference between indigenous practices and the practices that were introduced as part of contact and colonization. So the opening slide is uh, Neil Rockart, uh, welcome to Kanaka Bar. That is the students asked, who are we? And they drew the horizon and the Kai Creek uh, that flows out of it. Okay, now if I've done this correct, I hit this. Oh, too far. This is the Intlikatma Nation. The Intlikatma translates as the people here. So as, as, a, as an Indigenous people would introduce yourselves first as Intlikatma, meaning one of the residents within the Red Polygon area. Um, this map has been known by the Shiashingo, or the people below Spasm. That's actually what it translates at, the people below Spasm, by the stat limbs to the, to the left, the Shushwaps to the north, and to the Silk to the right. Um, to the United States, the Intlikatma know, are known as the Upper Skagits because our traditional territory, our nation land, is bisected by the 49th parallel. Within the Intlikatma nation lands are these community watersheds. So for 8,000 years, Indigenous communities lived as separate and distinct autonomous communities. And it is within these smaller areas where title and rights are vested in the cookbees or the leaders of the community. So within the Purple Polygon area, um, land and resource uses is determined by cookies or head men and women. Um, it's not hereditary. These positions are earned through knowledge and through skill and skill sets. So most communities have about five cookies. Um, in 1876, uh, the concept of Indian Act chief and council were introduced. And so I introduced myself as Cookby Kanaya, and I've been known as a cookie since I was about 12. But in May, I became the chief. So I'm actually amalgamated the traditional form of governance with the Indian Act Chief and Council. So that's just a little bit of history about uh, my nation and my community. Uh, let's get into the meat and potatoes now of HPA. Um, the first thing I want to talk about here is that with HPA and the way I read it is that there seems to be this focus on physical. My challenge with physical is then if you want to spend the rest of your life going through ups and downs like an egg, then you've actually forgot about the fact that health is holistic. You have to maintain a balance between the physical, the mental, emotional, and spiritual. That's critical. You can't be so strong in one because then the other area. So as a First Nations individual, I always try to maintain balance. And so you'll see the concept of the medicine wheel. It's also part of my sharing. And if I didn't forget, my hat would be on my hat. It's to remind myself every day to walk through life in balance. It's a gift that was given to us by a creator to choose balance. Highs and lows created by eggs. I'm just saying eggs, I just was on the internet and I wrote it right click and stole that thing. I'm going, wow, yeah, because that's precisely what happens. Some people can get too high, but when your egg rolls, then you can go low. So health is, is holistic, but as we know from about the 1940s, there was a guy called Maslow, and he said there were foundations of uh, uh, foundations of needs. Now I have a Maslow image that I I've corrupted by putting Wi-Fi and battery storage at the bottom, but I won't be sharing that today. But uh, you can certainly dig around. I, that's in one of my presentations from another event. But my main point here is through Kanaka Bar's story and through HPA's efforts, we can work together to ensure that British Columbia have the solutions, the alternatives and the options to be capable of handling climate change, the extreme weather events and the catastrophes that the extreme weather events trigger. So that's that slide.
Now this slide deck is gonna get even more detailed. I'm gonna send it to Anita and uh, Charito and they can share that with you afterwards. So I, I won't actually be speaking to the slides. I'll just leave it up long enough for you guys to see it. So my, my, this slide is 8,000 years we lived sustainably with the land and resources. And in 1808, we had contact with Simon Fraser. The colony of British Columbia was declared in 1858. BC became a province in 1871. And so in the last 150 years, we're collectively facing a global existential crisis. So whose land and resource governance model works? Mine, 8,000 years old, or the settler government's 150 plus years? So we're collectively staring down a global existential crisis because for some reason, we can't stop doing what we're doing. We need more, 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 now, 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 me, me, me. That is a learned behavior that is foreign to my community. The Intlikatma word for colonization is greed. And we learned that more so in 1858 when we wound up fighting a protracted war with the gold miners who were destroying the land and resources for that little yellow powder. So we've actually spent a lot of time um, trying to understand contact, conflict. And, but the big thing is, it's now, um, oh, look, it's June 1st, 2022. The indigenous populations are here. The provincial government is here. The federal government is here. And so are the corporations. So when we look at DRIPA and uh, the TRCC, in particular, Article 92, um, we're all here. And we all want to get together. We want to work, work together. The lapel on my pen has the BC flag and the Canadian flag. We have an opportunity to do something amazing because we're staring down climate change. So what is climate change? Next slide, please. Whoa. Um, before we get into climate change, um, this is a slide deck that I did for the province of British Columbia. So that means the premier, his sitting ministers, as many MLAs as they could stick in a room and a bunch of chiefs. This was the warnings that Kanaka Bar was advancing. The physical impacts of climate change are increasing in frequency, duration, and intensity. The psychological impacts of climate change are also increasing in frequency, duration, and intensity. So you look at this, these are the concerns that my community have. Add in some more. Am I gonna be the next person to experience an atmospheric river? Will my house burn? Will my house freeze? Will my roof collapse? Will I experience a Del Reco and lose everything? So what happens here is unbeknownst, and maybe we're all aware of it, we're starting to experience physical and psychological impacts that are growing. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. So how then do we give British Columbians and Canadians that sense of well-being and that hope? I wear a yellow tie, it's called the eternal flame of optimism. I believe in our collective future. So I wanted you guys to see this. This is slide number seven, because it's not just physical, it's not just psychological. There's a whole lot of other things that are impacted by climate change and the extreme weather events. My greatest concern on the left-hand side is eventually we're gonna run out of money. That's financial crisis. If, we, if Victoria and Ottawa are bankrupt, how are we supposed to help British companies and Canadians who are suffering? How are we supposed to help out global citizens who are suffering? who are, are, are climate change refugees because there's no longer any water. So these are the things that of course are well known, articulated in many documentations, whether it be IPCC, uh, one of my favorite doomsday books is called From Unhospitable to Unhabitable by David Wallace Wells. And if you can suffer through that without experiencing psychological trauma, good on you. I'm just saying is uh, he was a New York Times editor and he started writing out. Our future is not predetermined. You don't have to have the right-hand side. What is the, what is the alternative? So the one thing, and this slide talks about here is, is that no one is immune. Wherever you are, whatever traditional territory you're on, you're facing climate change and the extreme weather events and the catast catastrophes that accompany uh, an extreme weather event. Whether it is a windstorm, that rips off your roof, whether there's a hailstorm that smashes through your windows or cracks up your car, whether it is extreme heat, wind and drought that had one spark burning down an entire town in 21 minutes. 
We are all experiencing this. And even if we're not directly impacted, we're getting hurt here in our hearts and minds. Is there a path forward? Absolutely. So in this document, again, I won't read this document. You'll read it here. These are just my words. Is climate change real? Yes. What is harm reduction? Easy. Stop burning fossil fuels. What is harm reversal? Suck the fossil fuels out of the air through natural or carbon sequestration, but also start repairing the very land and resources that we've damaged so much over the last 150 years. Replant the areas. Get the canopies back. Um, what is climate change transition and adaption? Serious again, this is that negative, the doomsday. The climate change extreme weather events we're experiencing now are a byproduct of the GHGs emitted up to about 20 years ago. So as we throw the resources at harm reduction, harm reversal, there's something called inertia and lag time. It's not going to get better in the next 20 years. It's going to get worse. And we're going to be okay. Because if you invest in your tomorrow today, you'll be okay. That's what Kanaka Bar's story is. What is resiliency? The ability to maintain these foundations of life, air, water, food, shelter, during an extreme weather event, and after it passes, come out and reestablish the systems that give us. For example, everybody wants to be on Facebook, but you can't do it during a power failure. But if you're sheltered in place, you come out and you fix your hydro lines afterwards. So quality of life and life are two different things, and I'm gonna get into a little bit of detail. On the right hand side are some documents. The November 5th link should work. I'm not 100% sure, okay? If these things will work, but we'll certainly work on it, but these are all online. So we have the document that I referred to earlier, climate changes, wolves, the resilient housing. I thought we had more time. And I believe you guys were asked if you wanted to, to watch the video of Town Lost in 20 Minutes. And if you recall, that features myself, my wife, and my daughter. At, when we lost our home, we are still okay. But since we lived in intergenerational, we now live separate and apart. So my wife was really choked because she said, we lost our home, meh. But only after we're separated from each other did we started feeling homeless. So when you watch it, it's a poignant story. And that's why I said at the very beginning, you do not want to be going through what my, my family are going through. So you'll be okay if you make those investments. So I'll, I'll leave that there. It's a lot of detail. This is a presentation I did for Asset Management BC. So this is our HPA base, air, water, food, shelter, energy, communications, transportation, and waste. Um, Anita, thank you very much for that introduction. I have no idea who writes that stuff, but they're really good because this is precisely what Kanaka Bar's focus is on. You can't eat money. Nowhere does it say economy and a positive return on investment. I don't even think HBEA talks about economy and positive return on investment. All I care about is foundations of life so that my children and grandchildren can have a life. If we make money as a result of it, that's a happy little mistake. That's Bob Ross for you right there. What we're doing to the land is producing cumulative effects. Cumulative effects is producing global warming or, or, and then global warming is producing extreme weather events. So be proactive and be okay or be reactive. This is a simple, simple, as simple as I could do. The answer is change your impacts, change the cycle. What we did in 150 years, we can undo. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, you can quote me on that. I just don't know if I stole it off the internet. All right, so that's that image. Um, when we talk about something called resiliency though, so we created, we codified our governance code. For example, I am chief until I die, I resign, or they throw my ass out of office. Um, but that created a little leadership uncertainty. So we codified the elections and governance code that says I face recall every, thir every 30 days. I don't have a two or four year mandate under the Indian Act. I don't have a four year mandate out of, uh, out of Ottawa or Victoria. I have a 30 day mandate. That's our custom. If I don't do what my membership tell me to do, I'm out of here. So when we look at the membership elections governance code, we also work together to create the land use plan, which is what we did in 2015, which is assessed all of the land and resource uses that had uh, occurred. We found it was ugly. 
Um, we, we did do a community economic development plan because we knew that we needed the resources, people, time, technology, and money. And economic development was supposed to give us the financial certainty, but we became very concerned because the pursuit of economics is why we're experiencing the worst case scenarios. So we transitioned, uh, we did a climate change adaption strategy and all these documents are online. And each and every one of you can, can download these documents and read it. If you've never seen a community economic development plan or a land use plan or a climate change adaption strategy or a CRP, go online. At Kanaka Bar, information is power and we give that information away for free. If you want what Kanaka Bar has, just go on our website and right click and steal. That's why we put it there. You need to be aware of your options and alternatives. So if Kanaka Bar story can give hope and, and a, a real sense of hope, not a false sense of hope, what Kanaka Bar is doing can be replicated and can be scaled up anywhere BC and Canada. Just people need to be aware of it. Now, the next few slides is, so by working with our membership off reserves as far away as Texas, New Brunswick and Alaska, they gave me a five-year mandate. So these are the projects that I must do for lands and resources in the first two, three, and five years. That's land, that's governance, that's health, that's culture, that's education, that's infrastructure, that's economic development, whoops. And the issue is, if you want to see this in greater detail, download it from our website. It's called the CRP, the Community Resiliency Plan. This is what I'm doing over the next five years. I'm not doing more. I'm not doing less, I'm just doing this. Because leadership are supposed to listen to their membership, correct? Well, that's what we do here at Kanak Bark. we listen. They tell us what to do, then we do it. One of Kanak Bark's secrets is after this talking is done, we do. If we make a mistake, we learn from it. If, we, if, we, if, we, if it's working, we live with it. And then we start scaling it up. We can produce more meats, fruits, and vegetables if we need to. We can produce more potable water if we need to. We're just producing enough now to meet the needs, the immediate needs of the community while generating surplus for the region. So earlier I spoke about what is life and what is quality of life. So I thought, hey, let's get granular. Let's really grind down. Air. Air at Kanaka Bar is light, heat, wind, cold, rain, and particulates. And we monitor it 24-7, 365. And the, when I was growing up, we kind of knew it was going to rain at 4.27 p.m. on Thursday, next Thursday. Nowadays, we can't. Climate change has completely affected the weather so that it is, it's almost unpredictable. So we've set up our own technology to monitor all of these things. So, and again, an air quality monitor is only $300. Why would you determine your feature based on air quality monitors in Kamloops or Vancouver? For Pete's sake, spend the $300 and put one on your house, right? Same as me, Lytton was supposed to have hit 49.6, but our temperatures were at 55 degrees Celsius last June. Their thing was broken. Everybody knew Lytton was 55 degrees Celsius. What's that, 140 degrees? We were hotter than Death Valley last year. And we know this because we have the same technology that has been used by the Ministry of Environment federally. We're just not connected. Although the weather station, if you're going to my thing, is uh, downloading the information from Kanaka Bar. Water. Water, the issue for British Columbians and Canadians is not water scarcity, it's going to be water storage. Too much water in the spring, too much water in the fall, followed by none in the winter and summer. So store it. Water is needed for ecosystems, health, drinking, irrigation, fire protection, energy production, of course, sharing potable water for those who need it. That's the waterfall at Kanaka Bar, literally. This is the priority. So we've started investing in water reservoirs. We're looking at the, the watersheds to see whether or not we can create beaver ponds that allow water to flow naturally during the dry months. Don't tell everybody else that your ecosystems don't have to collapse. Next thing you know, everybody's going to want to put their own man-made beaver ponds in the mountains, but that's too far ahead into the future. I'll have to double check to see if it's in the, the CRP. I mean, with 80 projects over seven planning areas, even I don't know what all of them are. So I shared that one because I have to read it all the time. Food. 
We did a study in 2016. We were 100% dependent on the market in 2016. We're not anymore. Now, we have producing reports now. We're, we're up to producing 25% of the meats, fruits, and vegetables. We haven't gotten into cheese and milk yet, but we're only steps away. So we're growing the meats, fruits, and vegetables. For So we raise carrots and potatoes, but we also are starting to, to irrigate our own traditional foods. The heat and the wind and the cold is destroying the ecosystems. So we're starting to put into uh, irrigation and management our traditional food sources. So we can have the, the, the medicines and the traditional foods in conjunction with carrots and potatoes and tomatoes and corn and beans. But one of the weird things about our food system is uh, we just unveiled, I believe on Earth Day, our CR, our Controlled Environment Agriculture. We're actually raising fruits and vegetables in shipping containers. So it doesn't matter how hot it is outside or cold or dry. Controlled environment agriculture is how you can continue to produce meats, fruits, and vegetables regardless of the weather. Shelter. Well, what can I say about shelter? You want something that won't blow away, won't burn, won't uh, uh, have uh, two by fours blown through the window. Well, what's another one? And you know what? If it's minus 32, you want your water to come in and your poop to go out. I'm just saying as having experienced three of those things in the last 11 months. I know what it's like to be out there at minus 32 trying to thaw out your water and your septic. It's not fun. What I learned was if I had heat traced the water line in and the septic out, heat trace is different from cells, I would never have frozen in the first place. But heat trace is really expensive. It's about $4 a foot. But I can tell you this, the next time it gets cold at my home, I'll never freeze. And my home is a 387 square foot RV. So you need to understand your shelter. We did that ceremony on May 27th. I, I see one or two of your participants maybe there in person and or stuff. So we've we put together a competition. We asked the world to tell us the best possible systems and envelopes so that can weather the, the extreme weather events. And we unveiled those on May 27th. And I want, again, your group to be aware of this. Because if you have not been directly impacted, you can make this investment in your healthy built environment. There's little things that are out there that can stop you from being in response mode. You just need to be aware of your alternative and options. And if you have a question, email me. I'm happy to tell you how we overcame your problem. For me, I just YouTube it. That stuff really works. This is the water system that was delivered on May 26th. It's powered by the sun, and it will produce up to 500 uh, water for 500 people per day. If you want to know about the clear flow system, look them up. It's affordable, and it can be operated by 12-year-olds. You can sit there and invest massive or millions of dollars in, in huge chlorination plants, or you can get this system. He's got a mobile eight, a mobile 10, a mobile 20, and a mobile 40. The mobile eight is on wheels, sets up in three hours. So when we look at this from a health perspective of water is life, these systems exist. This is made in British Columbia by British Columbians for British Columbians, but it's the first time it was actually set up in British Columbia. This system is deployed internationally, but not here in BC, because God forbid British Columbians need potable water. Anyway, I digress. Please look up ClearFlow on the internet if you want more information on that system. This is the 32 new homes that we're building at Kanaka Bar. So we cut, the, we broke the ground on the project to the, to the left-hand side of your screen. That's called TCP. The TCP is also known as the crossing place. Remember, cluck cluck means the crossing place. Hmm. Now you can have... Uh, you know, HBEA, or you can have a AAC, or you can have a TCP. We, everybody hates acronyms. I'm just saying the crossing place is 24 affordable housing units, not social housing, with a community amenities building powered by battery uh, or by solar and wind with battery storage. If the lights go off in the Fraser Canyon, this entire subdivision will stay lit. And as a result, if it's 55 degrees, the residents here will be cool in the summer. And if it's minus 32, the residents will be warm in the winter, regardless of the weather and regardless of the roads we've been washed out by an atmospheric river or the hydro poles have been burnt 
or fallen through wind or broken through a tree's falling or whatever. Resiliency is the ability to shelter in place, maintaining the, the foundations of life and then repairing the systems that we like because everybody wants to be on Facebook as soon as the event passes. I'm just saying Facebook is a really prime motivator for my membership anywhere in North America. That was May 27th. It's under construction. We're hoping that we can put backs in beds by October of, what year am I in? 2022. I hate it when I ask that question. <laughs> I'm just saying my mind's a little busy. So by October of 2022, we're hoping to house 32 families whether they're evacuees or let's say that uh, Linda Stevens wants to move to Kanaka Bar. Call me. I'm just saying Linda Stevens' name is there. I know a Linda Stevens up in the Williams Lake area. I'm just saying is affordable housing, hydros included, and it doesn't matter what the weather is. All you have to do is move to the middle of nowhere. I know. It's kind of funny. What are quality of life? You know, you've heard me talk about it already a little bit. It's energy communications, transportation, and waste. Energy. Kanaka Bar has 8,000 years of solar, wind, and hydro data in our collectors conscious. We started recording it. We now know that regardless what our electrical needs are for the next 1,000 years, we have wind, sun, and water. So we've now invested in solar, in wind, and hydro. And while we're selling some hydro to BC Hydro, what we're really doing is putting all our HPE. Now, for example, this band office that I'm sitting in, I'm speaking to you from, it's hydro bill is $10 per month because we're producing all the electricity it needs. The system costs 18,000, but I only pay $10 a month. And that is the cost of being connected to BC Hydro's grid. Before we put the solar in, our hydro in the summer was 400 because we had to air condition it. Solar works and it's affordable. If you're not looking at it, it's because you're looking at the, the business case analysis from four or five years ago. Solar has tripled in efficiency and basically gone down by over 75% in cost. You need to do your solar analysis now, not on last year's data. It's such a growing field. If you want to pay BC Hydro $1,000 a month, well, you're crazy. Anyway, I digress um, because, you know, don't ask the guy that's crazy to who, what, what crazy is. Digress. Energy. Communications. You know what? All kidding aside, you can always go visit your neighbor and talk to them. I bet you, Anita, you still have a fax machine. I'm just saying somebody out there still has a fax machine or an old rotary dial. I'm just saying is cell phones and social media. We love the Internet. My membership do too. So to make sure that we have connectivity during an extreme weather event or the catastrophe, we installed our own cell tower because we're connected to this system right now. But if the power went off, I'm going to lose this because there's no battery storage, but I can continue the conversation on this because this has the Zoom link. I have five bars here in the middle of nowhere. So remember, Linda, I have five bars. Call me. Transportation. One of the things that people don't realize that was really vulnerable to extreme weather events and the climate change as wolves, what I call them, is your transportation system, be it rail, be it, be, uh, be it sky train, be it airplanes, be it helicopters, you can always walk or bike. But why do you if you're already self-sufficient and you're resilient? Why would you need to go to town? My town burnt. If there's an extreme weather event and the catastrophe and we're in response mode, why do you need to go to the town if you've invested in your own self-sufficiency, sustainable and resilient? Remember, the idea behind it is to minimize the impacts on you mentally, emotionally, physically and spiritually. If you know with certainty you're going to be OK for 24, 36, one week, one month, you're going to feel good. Waste. Now, this one is tricky. There's no poop fairy. I know a lot of tenants think that they just hit flush. Woo, it's gone. I'm telling you right now, that's not true. There's a lot of work in waste management. And you all know that plagues occur and other diseases are born, pestilence, and come from improper waste management. 
So we're focused heavily on making sure there's proper disposable of the liquid, the, uh, the liquid waste, as well as the garbage waste. Yesterday, I spent two hours on the phone with a company uh, because at this moment, the recycling programs that are listed list in rural BC is only getting 20% of, uh, of the materials out. So we're gonna sit down here and we're going to set up uh, a, a garbage receptacle and we will go through your garbage and we will pull out your cell phones and we will pull out your uh, old screen TVs. And then we're gonna source, uh, we're gonna separate them and then send them off to recycling. Because if you go to any landfill or, or uh, dumping site, you'll see people are still throwing stuff out. And it's because I have no idea. I'm just saying is my mom used to wash tin cans, take the paper off, then put it in a black bag. If you don't have proper recycling programs, right, you're still generating waste. My mom wanted to reduce her, uh, uh, her ecological slash environmental footprint. What we've did is we set up the recycling programs so that each and every one of us who are British Columbians and Canadians, and of course, all citizens of this world can do our part. We should not be throwing stuff into the landfill that doesn't need to be there. And finally, um, obviously, what you do to land, you do to yourselves. I've, I've always say that. We've started cleaning up the watershed. We've recovered 60 cars in the last year. Most people just throw their shit over the bank, and we wind up going over and cleaning it. But what we have then is that we have these incredible social returns. Our transition into uh, sustainable self-sufficiency, that resilient, has affected us here. To the best of my knowledge, Kanaka Bar is one of the only bands, if not the only band, that has no children in care on and off reserve. We have 100% graduation. We have people on disability, but nobody on social assistance. Um, I can go down all these social returns. Like, how do you measure success? How do you quantify a smile? Who cares? The one thing we don't have is an economy. We have quality of life and a lifestyle that is better than most places. We just don't have money. Remember, money is money can't buy you happiness. It can buy you an F-350. I'm just saying is this addiction to money is what's causing much of the psychological dis distress, in my view. I'm not even going to say my humble opinion because I don't think humble and me fit in the same part of the dictionary, but I digress. So this is what I'm saying is I was up at the, the landfill and you'll see barely a snippet of the items. That's where the lit and fire went through above it. This, this site survived. But when I was up there, I was looking at, this is barely a snippet of what is collected, is what is being thrown. So I went, I, I should have took some pictures of the bins and you'll see a massive amount of recyclable materials are just in the dumpster. Because it actually requires you to put your old TV. Look at that. One of the things under the e-waste looks like an old amber monitor from 1983. Because remember our choices back then was amber or green monitors? That's what that looks like. There is an old amber monitor. But this person at least made the effort to throw their garbage in the bin and put their e-waste over there. All I'm saying is when I go to the, my dumps everywhere, I see a massive amount of materials that could be repurposed. Instead, we continue to source it from external sources. And the, fire, and the environmental imprint of bringing in stuff from um, anywhere, US, China, Ukraine, there's a huge environmental footprint, but we seem addicted to bringing in more of that stuff. So there's lots that we can be doing. And um, again, I, I asked you guys and I showed you the presentations that I did on November 5th. So this is the snippet of the handout. All I'm saying is that if you want to have a healthy built environment, it's up to you. Be aware of your options. You can renovate, retrofit your bills to be resilient and you can design your, your, your bills and your supporting systems to be resilient or not. I know that some of my community, they have a nasty way of uh, putting it. If you don't invest in your tomorrow today, it'll suck to be you. But that's just how blunt some of my membership is. We were raised to get ready for the winter. 8,000 years, you prepared for worst case scenarios. So we're ants while surrounded by a world of grasshoppers. It's called Aesop's Fable 373. Those people who invest in their tomorrow today will be okay. And if Kanaka Bar can do it, so can you. So I have no idea why I did my time frame. Uh, it was 24 slides and it said 25 minutes. 
So Cook Shem, uh, everybody, and uh, thanks. I'm looking forward to questions now or after the session.